Hey friends, I wanted to hop on real quick and make a clarification about my last live stream. In it, I talked about using the CPS instruction and the copy instruction. And I stated that I used the copy instruction as a bad habit. Now that part was true, but the second part I said is, I, don't, I really don't see a reason that you wouldn't use the CPS instruction. That part I need to clarify. Now, if you missed that live stream in it, we were talking about how to combine data and convert it into back into a real number. So in this case, and what I'm going to say is mainly there's a colon here. That means it's coming from some type of I.O. out here. And if I right click it and I'm going to monitor it, then we're at position 198 of an array that has 446 elements in it. So if we're copying, which don't worry, if you had a few other questions about the copy, I'm going to explain what the copy is in a second. So if you were copying data and something interrupted it right here, such as an IO update, then half of our data could be the old data and the other half could be new data. And so it really does clearly state this in the instructions is if I'm going to highlight it and I go ahead and go to instruction help on the copy or the CPS. <clears throat> and then when we go down just a little bit, and we're going to come back up and talk about this length because this is the other one that still there were some questions about. But mainly we're going to look right here. During the execution of the COP and CPS instructions, other controller actions may interrupt the copy instruction and change the source. That's kind of what I was talking through there. If the source or destination is a produced tag, consume tag, IO tag, data from another task or a non-atomic tag that is written by a remote device, then we should use the CPS instructions. And so what that's going to do is that's going to prevent the source data from changing during the copy operation. Now, there's some notes here, though. The tasks that attempted to interrupt the CPS instruction are delayed until the instruction is done. So usually one our IO is going to be time critical. It's going to delay that update of it. And also if we have a periodic task, which in this case I have a PID operation, and I want this to fire every 200 milliseconds, then if I use the CPS instruction, it could delay the execution of that. So if your data could change midstream of a program, you want to use the CPS instruction. If it can't, you want to use the copy instruction. Now, the other two big questions were the move and the length again, because the length is the most confusing thing of both the copy and the CPS instruction. So a move instruction, I don't know if I have one really quickly available. There you go. We have an MOV, or it's now it's an MOVE, and we have an MOV instruction to what um, it used to be. But this takes a single source and moves it to a single destination. Actually, we should spend a little bit more time on this in another video uh, because there are a few other little quirks about it. And I have class. They'll be here in a little bit, so I can't spend a lot of time on it. But what a copy does is it takes a group of data and puts it into a group of destinations. Oops, didn't mean to do that. So in this case, I could take this and put it here. And I could take it to something like, we'll just put destination bracket, zero bracket. I'm going to get a red X because that isn't there. But that'll give us an example here. Now, the key is the link. Now, if our data types are the same, in this case, they're not, though. Notice this says that it is a SINT, and this one was a DINT, but imagine it's an array of DINTs. Then our sizes are different of those. So it's good to make a choice. Which one do you want to make the copy based off of? And so if we go back to our help and we go up here, then our length, is the number of destination elements to copy. Now, there. this is probably one of the common questions I get is because it's like, okay, number of elements is 
you know, even if several people were like, well, we're working with bits. Is that, shouldn't that still be the number of bits? And no, it's not the number of bits. So the way I kind of explain it to people, especially when we're dealing with different data types, is it's the number of bits times the length of this. So in this case, in fact, I should make this something that, in fact, yeah, we're going to make this destination one. That way it kind of makes sense. And we'll go ahead and create it. And I want to make this a dent of a dim zero of 10. That'll get us close enough. Is in this case, this is a double integer and it's a size 10. So that means there's a double integer. Let's just monitor it and make sure I don't want to rush too much. Is if we open the arrow by it, there are 32 bits in it, zero through 31. And it's going to take that number times 10 or it's going to get 320 little bits in it. So up here we have 198 as an S in integer, a small integer. We open it up, and in it there's eight of them. So in the end, we're going to need that 320 divided by eight. So 320 divided by eight is going to be 40. So we would get 198, and it would need to grab 40 of these to put into that other one. Now, I explained the rest of the, exactly what's going on in the other video, so I'm not going to go too far in the weeds of it. But I did want to hop on before everybody got here for class and just clarify that one point because yeah, I, I clearly misstated. And I do, you know, and here's the I really do appreciate when y'all are like, hey, I don't feel that's exactly right what you said because that, that's a very important clarification. So everybody have a great week. And if you missed that live stream, then here, as soon as YouTube's done processing, I will put a link to it right here, along with that um, other video that I talked about along the Micro 800, as far as how we're going to get by not having a swap byte or bit distribute instruction. Have a great week.